All right. Um, I assume if you're watching this video, you're likely a music student uh, from one of my A-Day sections who's missing Monday's class. Um, I'm going to try and give you um, what you miss from the notes through this exercise. Obviously, there's a lot of in-class exercises that we'll be doing too. I've posted links to the ones that would be accessible to you outside of class. Some just might be really hard to replicate outside of class, so I apologize for that. Uh, but hopefully this will get you at least the content that you might need. Um, so you might notice even here from my opening slide that people are gonna be getting a bunch of resources on Monday. They'll get their handouts for the week, um, including their study guide for this unit's test. And um, I'm gonna give people an updated copy of the pacing guide. So uh, if you're back in school on B-Day on Tuesday, um, you might stop by my classroom to pick that stuff up because that paper copies of the stuff might be more helpful to use with this exercise or with this set of notes in general. Um, well, I'll also be drawing people's attention to um, a handout that they're going to pick up and that is posted in Canvas for you already um, in this module stuff. Uh, I'm going to be asking people to complete a big five personality inventory uh, for Thursday's class. Um, Friday, of course, for B-Day students. Um, it's pretty easy to do online. It's something that most likely people will be doing outside of class. If we do end up with time to spare during Monday's lesson, I might give people time to get started on it. Uh, but you do want to make sure and record your percentiles uh, and the interpretation of your test results because we're going to be using that stuff as an in-class activity um, when I see you again. So make sure you take care of that. Um, there'll also be some questions posted in Socrative. Um, I, I'll probably keep them up for a while so you could try them on your own. Um, I can't keep them up indefinitely. So at some point they're just gonna disappear in favor of newer ones. So um, if you have a chance to take care of that, awesome. Um, so uh, just to recap, when we left off in my uh, last class period, most of my sections had gotten through um, some introduction to psychodynamic theory, which we, um, we talked about in the context of psychoanalytic theory that it's kind of a legacy of that approach. These were theorists who took some of Freud's ideas but modified them heavily, especially de-emphasizing childhood sexuality. Um, another contribution of the psychodynamic folks was the advent of projective style tests. Um, so in class, when I covered this with people, I'd present them with this image and ask them to give me an explanation of uh, what's ha what they think is happening in the picture. So how would you tell a story about what's going on here? Uh, and the reason I do that is because it's a good introduction to this projective style test stuff. Um, students had also been asked to do um, you know, some doodling exercises and maybe a sentence completion test. Um, those kinds of things are all projective uh, in nature. And the reason that psychodynamic theorists referred to these things as projective style tests is that they harness the Freudian defense mechanism of projection. The idea is that when people are completing them, um, they're actually just, because the stimuli that you give someone is neutral, like the kid with the violin, it's not really clear what's going on there. Um, there's lots of potential ways you could interpret it. Uh, because the stimulus itself is neutral, any extra content that people are adding is presumed to be a projection of their own unconscious feelings, conflicts, um, or ideas. So for example, um, one of the more famous projective style tests is the Rorschach inkblot test. It was developed by a gentleman named Herman Rorschach, that's where the name comes from, uh, in the 1920s. And um, the, a lot of people are familiar with like the pop culture version of this where um, you present the um, slide that's got an ink blot on it uh, to a patient and ask them to explain what they see in the image. Um, and it is administered in general that way. The idea is that uh, perhaps the types of things that people are reporting seeing in the ink blots reflect aspects of their personality that may be unconscious to them. So for example, a typical uh, example of the kinds of assumptions you could draw from an ink blot test, like maybe someone who harbors some like paranoid ideation and thinking in their personality uh, might consistently be reporting seeing eyes staring back at them um, from some of the Rorschach ink blots. And of course, they're not necessarily aware that in giving that description 
um, that that's going to reveal something about their personality. Um, likewise, the image you had just looked at is an example slide or prompt from the thematic apperception test or TAT, uh, which has a similar style to it. It's intended to do the same thing. Just instead of using ink blots, people are presented with images, usually ones with people in them, and they're asked to kind of tell a story about what they see going on in that image. Um, again, the idea is that people will be projecting as they do this. Uh, so the types of situations they bring up might reveal something about conflicts or things that are on their mind. Um, and they might not necessarily know they're revealing them. And I think that's what people kind of perceive to be the advantage of these projective style tests is that um, there's something kind of surreptitious or hidden about it that people you're not just relying on people to self-report because people don't always have um you know the best window on their own functioning so maybe this is a way that allows them to reveal stuff without self-censorship like they're not going to uh, censor their responses because they don't know what kinds of things their responses necessarily would be revealing now that being said uh, there's big problems with the validity and reliability of these kinds of tests and in fact to discuss that a little bit um in most of my classes, we are going to be taking a look at some suggested scoring criteria for these doodling exercises uh, as an illustration. You know, this is meant for an in-class illustration. It's totally not to be uh, meant to be a serious type of personality test. So I do want you to keep that in mind. Uh, but here we have on the screen, um, and I did uh, post them in the earlier lesson as well, um, some scoring criteria that could be used to interpret the drawings that people did in their doodling tests. Uh, this, this would have been the stuff that you're filling in in those boxes in response to like the square and the triangle and whatnot. So we've got things like, oh, if you drew a house, that indicates feelings of security. A lot of my students did draw houses in, in the box uh, example. Um, or um, drawing, drawing boats <laughs> indicate a fixation or dependency on one's mother. Interesting. Um, maybe some, you know, phallic phase types of stuff, uh, you know, uh, coming up there. Drawings with a high level of creativity and imagination reflect a person with creative potential. I mean, these are interesting ideas, but as my students look at them, and usually if we're in class, we kind of discuss strengths and limitations of these kinds of guidelines, um, it becomes kind of obvious that, okay, there may be some problems with this. For one, uh, the interpretation of these things might be somewhat subjective. Like someone's responses to the Rorschach, if we're doing the inkblot test, or if we're interpreting someone's drawing, like it might be a little subjective in the sense that who gets to decide what a high level of creativity and imagination in a drawing is. Um, likewise, the Rorschach itself has been criticized in that um, ratings on it do seem to be pretty subjective like some time even though people get a lot of training before they can administer those types of tests and interpret them um two different psychoanalysts might actually come up with two different interpretations of the meaning of someone's responses um even after listening to the same subject's responses that's a problem with reliability uh and then of course we have problems with validity too validity is is this really measuring what it's claiming to measure. I mean, is it true really that uh, drawing a bunch of circles in the doodling task, uh, you know, circular lines, uh, does that indicate dependency? Uh, there are ways you could go about assessing that and establishing uh, cross-validation of this test. Um, the research on that has been very mixed for our major projective tests. So the Rorschach and the TAT, for example, as well as drawing exercises like this doodling exercise. So as we think big picture about the psychodynamic theorists and their approaches, um, you know, we want to be able to pro con this just like we did psychoanalysis. So if you're filling in your gigantic grid sheet, you know, this would be stuff that we'd be placing in that very last box beneath the assessment strategies. So you know, thinking big picture about these advantages um, and disadvantages. For one, um, the psychodynamic folks in general, so people like Horney, uh, Adler, Jung, Erickson, um, they did something that was probably helpful given some of the deficits with psychoanalysis. I mean, they really de-emphasized the sexuality, which a lot of people in retrospect um, think was probably uh, a good move, right? Like, uh, it's probably not Oedipus and Electra complexes that drive personality development in early childhood. They recognized that and instead drew our attention to social factors, which probably a good step forward. Um, and again, like I mentioned with the projective tests, a lot of people kind of like the idea of these things uh, because you're not just relying on self-reports, which can be problematic in survey research and in assessment in general. Um, instead, 
people are people's personalities are being measured kind of indirectly and it, this probably is like theoretically is not important, but a lot of my students really like doing the projective exercises. They find them enjoyable. They like doing the drawings. They like looking at an ink blot and trying to, you know, imagine what they can envision within it and how they would explain it. Um, and so it's kind of a fun challenge. Like, you know, so maybe there's something appealing about this way of testing. Um, but if we look at the downsides here, I mean, it's hard to escape the fact that, you know, if you thought the unconscious was an unscientific concept, if that's a downside of Freud's original psychoanalytic model, this psychodynamic model still embraces that. Like it has not moved away at all from the idea that mo most of our functioning is unconscious and that we have a lot of like, you know, uncomfortable hidden conflicts uh, within that unconscious. And the tests that were developed in association with psychodynamic theory really have been troublesome in terms of like as assessment strategies you know uh, they're very subjective they seem to be low in their uh reliability and validity which is a problem if you're trying to draw conclusions about uh, for sure about diagnosis or just about people's uh, personality and trying to give them feedback in any kind of meaningful way uh, so you know hooray psychodynamic folks for moving us forward from freud but there's still some essential problems with freud's model that maybe they they hadn't moved further further enough from, uh, it might be a way of characterizing it. Now, um, as we move forward in the unit, we're gonna actually start looking at models that very much challenge some of the core assumptions of psychoanalysis. And one of those models is the humanistic approach, which does involve um, at least one theorist that you've met before uh, in the form of Abraham Maslow. So in class, uh, I'm going to have people do this exercise, so give them a few minutes to work on it. Um, and because it kind of harnesses some of Maslow's ideas, um, I'll give them a few minutes to you know, jot down some things that they think might be blocking them from achieving their fullest potential at school. Uh, the purpose of that is to kind of keep it narrow and restricted, because if we make it like blocking you from achieving your fullest potential, like in life, that gets a little big and unwieldy. Um, so after they've had a moment to do that, the next step for them is going to be trying to identify what they had written down and linking it to a specific phase or a specific level uh, in Maslow's hierarchy. Because some people will... Um, come up with, you know, maybe it's friendship related drama. You know, maybe one thing that's super distracting uh, is like conflicts that one's having within one's friends group or socially in high school. Well, if that's the case, then that'd be like a level three issue uh, that might be preventing you from reaching self-actualization, at least in relation to school. Um, if maybe um, you've had some housing instability, you know, maybe uh, your family's in a tough spot right now and you're not really uh, sure that you're going to have the shelter that you need uh, or food and like food scarcity has been an issue, well, that'd be a physiological need kind of thing. Um, so the reason I have people start with this model is in part because it helps draw our attention to a couple important things about the humanistic approach, um, which I'll get you into uh, here. So uh, the humanistic approach um, emerges at a different point in time than psychoanalysis. So this would be, again, our third box uh, in that um, grid sheet that we're filling out. Uh, and in our key names that we're gonna wanna associate with this perspective, uh, Carl Rogers and Abraham Maslow are gonna lo loom large. Maslow, we already know some stuff about. Our warm-up exercise got us uh, re-familiarized with that, uh, his hierarchy of needs one more time. Um, but I, I've even chosen the background for this slide to be consistent with some of the assumptions of this model. Um, in some ways, um, this model could not be more different uh, from psychoanalysis. Uh, it developed at a later time in the United States in the 1960s. Um, some of you that may recall from your uh, US history classes, there was a lot of social and cultural change happening in the United States during the 1960s. Um, a big uh, part of that was an, uh, an emphasis on like self-development, especially the counterculture of the 1960s. It was really um, driving people's kind of toss off tradition and maybe even like um, you know, the wishes or aims that are imposed on you by your culture um, and instead seeking self-fulfillment and self-development. It makes sense that this model emerged during that time because this model is going to really strongly emphasize self-development, um, maybe even to the exclusion of influence 
from others, which some people have pointed out is problematic. Um, but it was really attempting to be a course correction on what was perceived of, or what was perceived as a real problem with psychoanalysis, which had been dominant until that time. Um, the big breakthrough or the new contribution of the humanistic folks was like, hey, maybe developing models of personality based entirely on people who are very not well. You know, the folks that Freud was working with, of course, were uh, the hysteric patients and folks with uh, neurotic anxieties, uh, or at least that's how he would have described it at the time. Um, those folks were struggling psychologically. Um, and humanistic folks would say, you know, maybe there's a problem with that. Maybe when we're trying to understand um, human beings, we should focus on thriving and what allows people to do well, um, what will put people on a path toward better development. Um, so the, and developing the models and the constructs that come out of humanistic theory, our principal researchers here focused very much on people who are doing well, um, people who are thriving in their environments, not people who were perceived as ill or sick. Um, and Maslow is a perfect example of that. So if you think back to that exercise we did a moment ago, one idea, uh, a core idea from Maslow that's going to permeate this perspective is this notion that we're striving towards self-actualization, that human beings in our default tendency are moving toward being better versions of ourselves. And of course, that doesn't mean that we're always doing well all the time. And that's in part why I had you do that exercise as the warm-up, because um, you know we could be blocked maybe, um, from achieving our fullest potential if some other needs are not being met in our environment. So it's not that um, Maslow's hierarchy or the concept of self-actualization or the humanistic approach in general doesn't have any way of explaining why someone might be functioning suboptimally. They do. Uh, but their argument is that our default is in movement toward better, uh, movement toward growth, uh, and becoming better versions of ourselves. We can get stuck along the way, but the default trajectory is toward betterment. Uh, and of course, you may recall uh, that Maslow later um, suggested that it's not just self-betterment, that eventually self-actualizing people may move beyond self-fulfillment and try and work to better society and, and better the lives of other people. He called that self-transcendence. Um, but this whole concept of self-actualization, the idea that at their like optimal growth and fulfillment, um, people are trying to become the best versions of themselves. Um, that and his whole idea of what that looked like, which you'll have a chance to explore a little bit more in depth if you would like, um, is like, in fact, if you want to fill out the self-actualization scale, um, which I have linked in the resources uh, in Canvas for you, um, that's going to ask you a bunch of questions and then give you ratings on various components of self-actualization. Like Maslow, for example, thought self-actualizing people uh, appreciate aesthetics and beauty. Uh, and so, and maybe on a regular basis, connect with beauty in their lives, um, that they can move through life uh, kind of undeterred by um, challenges. You know, they, they recognize that challenges exist, but move through them with less struggle, maybe, um, especially less psychological struggle uh, than folks who are not in that position. And certainly like the self-acceptance, um, understanding and accepting and having a realistic view of oneself um, is part of self-actualization as well. And he drew these conclusions, like his whole notion of self-actualization is based on case studies, kind of historical ones that he had done on uh, figures, especially from history or like political leadership that um, he believed reflected people who lived rich and productive lives. And uh, keep in mind this rich part, sometimes my students misunderstand what that means. That does not mean um, financial stability. Um, he's selecting people that he thinks lived very full lives uh, and harness their skills in really productive uh, ways uh, for the, maybe even sometimes for the betterment of society. So, and, and that's great, um, you know, so this is idea of self-actualizing or striving toward betterment um, can be a very helpful concept. Uh, and it draws our attention to like the idea that human beings default tendency is good, um, which is so different than Freud's view that like, at our core, we've got these id impulses that are like murderous and like aggressive um, and like self-serving. Um, you know, Freud's view of people at their um, at their default functioning uh, was that they're 
kind of evil and that they're kind of barely being restrained uh, from acting on their baser urges by the trappings of society, um, Maslow would argue the opposite. Uh, and that idea is also going to be embraced by our other key thinker uh, in the humanistic approach, Carl Rogers. Um, Carl Rogers, if you, okay, he always looks super, I actually think this is kind of not unimportant to pay attention to. Like, if you look at the pictures and the images of our humanistic theorists, they do tend to look pretty happy and upbeat. Uh, contrast that with scowling Freud, right? Like, he, he, Freud always looked kind of like morose or uh, skeptical. Uh, and that may have, that seems consistent with his view on the world. Same thing with Carl Rogers over here. Does he not look like the most like happy grandpa ever? Um, like, and arguably he would have been probably a really affirming grandfather to have uh, because he's well known in psychology for developing an approach to psychotherapy called client-centered therapy. It's sometimes also called the person-centered approach. Uh, but the idea behind it is that when someone comes in for psychotherapy, they're actually in the best position to understand themselves. Um, so the job of a therapist in client-centered therapy is to help people, like to facilitate the process of maybe understanding oneself and one's problems. Um, but it's called client-centered in part because the client directs everything. It's a very non-directive uh, form of psychotherapy. The client gets to conceptualize what they think their problems are. Um, the therapist is just there to do some active listening and kind of support it. Um, and that's in part because um, what Rogers thought people were getting out of psychotherapy um, was, you know, a supportive environment uh, during, during which they could experience growth. So you're supposed to be kind of providing the conditions that would help people grow. Um, and like Maslow, he's going to agree that, you know, people, uh, healthy people at their core are good. Um, and all of us have the capacity for that goodness. Um, it doesn't mean we always express it, again, because maybe the environment imposes some constraints or limitations on this. So we may not be expressing it at every single moment, um, but we do try and strive toward betterment. And what psychological health looks like uh, to Rogers was that, you know, self-awareness, this is consistent with the idea of self-actualization. Maslow thought that self-actualizing people are very self-aware, they understand themselves um, and can like make conscious and perfect purposeful decisions about what they're about to do. Um, and that self-awareness, again, is just diametrically opposed to Freud's notion of the unconscious. I mean, Freud thought we were always, at every moment, driven by stuff that's kind of outside of our control. Um, but Rogers and the humanistic folks are going to argue the exact opposite of that, that we are at least capable when we are at our best and our healthiest. Uh, we're capable of being very conscious uh, of the things that are driving our behavior and that we're not moved by these external forces, right? Um, we're going to look at this issue of self-concept uh, a little bit in relation to Rogers, but um, healthy people do have a positive view of themselves, um, something that a lot of folks from various perspectives now would agree with, that that's a, a marker of psychological health. Um, that, again, just like the notion of self-actualizing here, um, Rogers' belief was that healthy people are good, uh, that they will do good things for each other. They're effective. They can work toward and, and reach their goals. And that in doing so, they exercise free will, that they're not victims of fate. And I do think this was an interesting and probably necessary course correction in the history of psychotherapy that um, you may recall us talking about this in relation to psychoanalysis. One of the unfortunate downsides of psychoanalysis and its dominance early in the 20th century was that because psychoanalysis is such a deterministic view of people, it suggests that our personality is kind of forged in early childhood, often as a result of some very specific things that our parents did uh, with us, like how they potty trained us, for example, how we resolved our Oedipus or electric complexes. Um, that kind of stuff suggests that your personality is kind of fixed in our early childhood. Um, there's not a lot you can do to correct it because this stuff is kind of unconscious to you. So you're kind of stuck being a victim of your early years. Um, Client-centered therapy assumes no such thing 
client-centered therapy and the humanistic approach assumes free will, that at any moment we can make a choice about how we want to behave and move forward bravely in that direction if we choose to do so. Uh, and that's a really powerful idea, that we're not stuck and we don't have to consistently view ourselves as like victims of the environment. We can change. Um, so and the concept of change and the idea that we can move forward and grow is really central to this way of thinking about people. And interestingly, um, Carl Rogers made an argument or like um, kind of laid out what he believed were the environmental conditions that would most help somebody move forward in their growth. And one of the very positive things that came out of it, um, it was that he didn't believe that this was something that was limited just to psychotherapy. Like he developed psycho, uh, client center therapy, so he believes that this is important and central to what counselors and psychotherapists would be doing. Um, but he also believed that like friends of people, teachers and parents can provide these kinds of supports for, uh, for the people in their lives and we can all help each other do better. Uh, so he uh, lays out three core conditions for growth and I'm actually gonna give you an acronym, so we'll see once these pop up on the screen how you might remember them later. But um, one of those conditions is acceptance, that um, people have to feel that they're met by acceptance from other people. So in uh, client-centered therapy, like self-acceptance is a goal. So being able to accept yourself as you are, uh, but also to experience acceptance from other people. And without condition, and, and that's hard, <laughs> like that's not an easy thing to do. And it's probably something that, I mean, I'm just gonna like insert my own opinion about this, like from, you know, that's okay. There's some research that supports it, yes. But I think especially in working with high school students, this seems really consistent with my experience. A lot of us get kind of conditional acceptance from other people in our lives, including even the people that we love the most. Um, they'll place conditions on our, on our well-being or self-worth by saying things like, I love you if, or, you know, I love you, but, and those kinds of things that suggest that we're only worthy and lovable if we do certain behaviors or engage in certain types of activities or maybe meet certain standards. Um, and that's not what Rogers was suggesting that we need. Uh, if you think of the concept of unconditional love, that's going to be closest to, to his notion of unconditional positive regard, which is sometimes abbreviated UPR. But it's the idea that um, we, we need to feel complete and total acceptance from others. Maybe not everybody at all times, but from our parents, from the people that care about us. Um, and that means accepting and respecting people as worthy and valuable beings without judgment, without evaluation, and without condition. And again, this is hard because a lot of us do want to place conditions on the worth of others. Like we think certain things are unacceptable. We don't like certain things about how someone else might look or dress. But to look beyond that and recognize like, okay, well, maybe I wouldn't do some of the same things this person is doing, but they're still worthy of respect and worthy of being treated well. That's what unconditional positive regard is. And people who are trained as client-centered therapists are trained to promote that and how they interact with other people. Um, I think a lot of us are kind of dying for more of this in our lives. Um, a lot of us feel like we, we kind of get this message that we're only okay if we do certain types of things. And then life becomes kind of a race to meet those conditions or meet those standards. And it, that brings some anxiety with it. You know, that like, oh no, what if someday I'm not going to be able to get the grades that make me a good person? Like, what if I'm not going to be able to do this thing that I think is going to be the thing that makes me a worthy and valuable person? What if you're worth and valued? doesn't have anything to do with those things at all. You know, what if you're worthy and valuable as a person because you exist? Um, that's a very different way of looking at the world uh, and one that might allow you a lot more freedom to move forward without anxiety. Uh, so the second condition beyond acceptance um, is genuineness that we need to be able to be genuine and experience the genuineness of others. Um, and by genuine, we mean that there's a congruence or a consistency between how we inwardly feel and what we're outwardly expressing to other people. Um, and again, in working with high school students, I think this is something we all might contemplate 
doing a little bit more in our lives. Um, incidentally, as a teacher, this concept of being genuine is something I always, at a yearly and weekly sometimes basis, have to come back to because it feels really gross to be someone who you don't think you are, um, to go through your life as though you're faking, um, to try and be these things that you think other people want you to be, even though that's not really you. Um, Rogers thought we all feel better and do better and uh, approach our fullest potential when we actually act outwardly who we really are. Um, and th of course, who we really are is going to be good at its core. But a lot of us don't do that because we're worried about what other people will think. Um, so we kind of try to bring our behavior in line with the expectations of others. Um, I, I will say, like, again, as a teacher, nothing has moved my own practice and my well-being forward more than this idea of genuineness. Like, because when you're learning how to teach, um, you work with a cooperating instructor, you get, you get a lot of instruction from university personnel, and they're all trying to give you certain, like, pedagogical theories or strategies that you're supposed to use because that's what good teaching looks like. And of course, some of those things are grounded in research and really important for people to keep in mind, but the moment I realized that I didn't have to be who my cooperating teacher was and that I didn't have to be just like a vehicle for all these different theories, I could be myself. And that was enough. And not only that it's enough, but it also frees other people to be who they need to be. Like, that's a really powerful thing. It keeps me grounded and it keeps me happy doing the kind of work I am. Like when I catch myself being not genuine, those are usually days when I'm not feeling as good about how I'm doing. Uh, and you might think about this too, like try just for a moment taking off the mask um, and being who you are around people and see what happens. Uh, people actually tend to respond to this much more positive, positively than you would imagine, though uh, certainly there are folks in our lives who are not good at providing some of these core conditions of growth, and that's the danger. Um, in fact, all three of these things, um, Rogers kind of, you know, would argue that it's a little bit like a three-legged stool. You knock one of these things out uh, and the rest kind of topple. Like, how is it that you could actually feel comfortable being genuine if you don't think that's going to be met with acceptance or if you don't think it's going to be met with empathy people are really understanding who you are um so in uh psychotherapy like the idea is that a person trained in client-centered therapy would exhibit these conditions like outwardly uh to try and promote them and maybe even model them uh for the clients that they're working with so that people can experience these conditions that promote betterment and fulfillment um, and you might notice now that we've got them all on the screen you can abbreviate them with the acronym AGE if you're trying to remember later like what the core conditions for growth are because they do lend themselves well to a nice acronym now um, in class once we've gone through this material I'll actually do a little Socrative exercise um, with students to show them um, like <laughs> there's actually a lot of consistency between Carl Rogers um, and if you're familiar with the PBS um, children's show host uh, Fred Rogers uh, from Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, their worldview is wildly similar, <laughs> like uh, so much to the point that it's often hard to pick apart like one's ideas from the other. Um, so this is just kind of a fun exercise where um, people are going to try, they're going to look at a bunch of quotes um, from uh, either from Fred Rogers or from Carl Rogers, like the humanistic theorist, and try to figure out which one said it. Um, but regardless, um, if even if later when you're thinking about who Carl Rogers is that you come back to this idea that it was Fred Rogers, you're not going to be that far off. Like this idea, um, you know, I think everybody longs to be loved and longs to know that he or she is lovable. And consequently, the greatest thing that we can do is help somebody know that they are loved and capable of loving. Um, it may be, okay, who would say that? Like Fred Rogers or Carl Rogers? That was actually a quote from Fred Rogers, the children's TV show host, um, even though it sounds very much like that idea of unconditional positive regard, like to show people that they're lovable and valuable. Um, but there's a lot of like great stuff in here. Um, in fact, you know, good mantras for being, uh, I, this one is one of my favorites from Carl Rogers, actually, this idea that what I am is good enough if I would only be it openly. Um, recognizing that you are enough. You don't have to be something other than what you are in order to like harness your self worth. Um, it's it's a good way. It's a good mantra for living, if nothing else. So if you want, you can go through and try and test yourself, see if you can figure out like who's who. I did link up that uh, Google Doc 
for you guys um, in Canvas so you can see it, so you won't exactly get the Socrative version of this, but that's okay. Um, so uh, once we're done with that, we'll also be doing another exercise that um, gets at some humanistic theory. Um, We'll, I'll, you know, give people time frames for doing this, but essentially um, they're going to use uh, the self-concept exercise that's linked uh, in the documents, and they're going to spend some time describing how they see themselves. This is your perceived self, uh, so you'd use that space to describe like kind of everything about the and that answers the question, "Who am I?" Um, so how you view yourself right now. That could include personal qualities, strengths and weaknesses, attributes, roles that you play. Um, skills that you have. It can, it can be anything. Uh, and then we're going to contrast that in that little t-chart with how people characterize their ideal self. So you'd be using that side of the t-chart to explain who you hope to be, who you would want to be, uh, your ideal version of yourself. And one thing that is uh, really important for high school students to note as they're doing this, we're not talking about your future like possible self. A lot of us, you know, uh, uh, as high school students, a lot of people are kind of looking ahead to who they want to be later in life. That's not what this is about. Um, here we want you to describe who, what would the best version of you look like today um, as a high school student. And of course, if you want, you know, you can pause the video, take some time to jot those things down for yourself. Um, we'll be looking at them uh, together in relation to some of Roger's ideas. Because in particular, um, the humanistic theory, you know, it has all these ideas that go with it, self-actualizing and Maslow's hierarchy, uh, the idea of core conditions for growth and client-centered therapy, which were contributions of Roger's. Um, but all uh, models of personality have to include some sort of assessment. Like, how is it that you tell where people are at in relation to these constructs that you've come up with? And humanistic psychologists, because they believe that human beings are so unique. Uh, in fact, one of um, Roger's concept is this idea that we own, we all live through our own unique phenomenological world. The idea that we all, through our own experience and our own vantage points, have a different view on the world, even if we're experiencing the same thing. So because they so honor the self and uniqueness and individuality, they actually would prefer not to use like traditional assessment strategies, certainly not personality inventories, um, because they don't feel that that uh, accounts for the full diversity of human beings. So client-centered therapists would prefer to use like open-ended interviews and conversation um, to try and get to know a client uh, to help see how they understand themselves. Um, but of course, that's a lengthy and time-consuming. Um, so maybe sometimes they might use exercises like the one that we just did. Um, the idea that, um, you know, to take a look at how someone views themselves and how they want to be. The whole idea is that as a client-centered therapist, you would be hoping to create the conditions that might help someone move from where they see themselves to their better version of themselves, their self-actualizing fullest potential self. Um, there's also different ways that you can assess self-concept. I'm gonna show you an exercise that you could use to do that if you wanted. Um, but the general idea is that when you're looking at that exercise, that perceived self versus ideal self exercise, or if you're looking at content from an interview that was done with a client, what you're looking for is their self-concept. Is it positive or negative? Um, if it's positive, then you're going to see a lot of alignment or congruence between how, what someone thinks about who they are uh, and what they want to be, their ideal version of themselves. Um, if they have a very negative self-concept, there's going to be large gaps. They kind of see themselves as one person, but they think uh, an ideal version of themselves would look very different. Um, and that doesn't mean that's impossible for you to like move beyond that gap, but you're likely to experience more psychological struggle and distress uh, if there's a large inconsistency between those things uh, is the idea. And of course, depending on our time constraints, I may have people try out one of those self-concept inventories. I've posted scoring guidelines in Canvas for you if that's something that you want to do on your own. But again, the self-concept is just the idea of how people view themselves. Um, and to a humanistic psychologist, um, you know, people, if they're healthy, would have a very like strong self-concept. They understand who they are. Um, they tend to ascribe to a positive view of themselves. Um, you know, and that those kinds of things are assessed on that inventory. Um, but okay, 
wrapping things up, <laughs> all approaches to personality have relative advantages and disadvantages. I do think there's some very helpful things about the humanistic approach. Um, I think it comes with it some really important reminders about what quality of life looks like for people, and that's good. Um, for example, like a lot of people today, regardless of whether they consider themselves a humanistic uh, psychotherapist or consistent with that idea at all, I mean, there's this general agreement that a positive self-concept is probably a sign of psychological health. Uh, people who are struggling more tend not to have a very positive self-concept. Um, and client-centered techniques, especially the idea of like non-directive interviewing, um, expressing empathy because it builds trust between people, um, encouraging genuineness, displaying unconditional positive regard, those kinds of things are so helpful in building client, um, uh, client and therapist relationships uh, in a psychotherapy setting that virtually all counselors or therapists get practice in how to do that and how to express those Ro Rogerian ideas in their behavior, um, even if they don't rely on clients that are therapy as their therapeutic technique. Um, and I do think there's something positive about this approach and that it is less deterministic than a lot of our other ones. Like it, it actually allows people to, they can change. Um, deterministic approaches tend to mean like your personality is determined by stuff, uh, often stuff outside of you. So for example, psychoanalysis is very deterministic because it suggests that a lot of our personality is forged in early childhood by forces that later will be unconscious to us. So you don't have as many avenues of moving forward or changing that because you're just fundamentally unaware of what those things are. Uh, whereas uh, the humanistic approach you know, believes that we can move consciously and purposefully in a different direction if we want to at any moment, that nothing is restraining us from that, um, and that we do get to exercise free will. Um, so that can be a positive thing, right? On the other hand, <laughs> downsides of this approach, um, okay, just like uh, the concept of the unconscious in psychoanalysis is considered to be kind of vague and subjective and untestable, um, things like self-actualization might be equally vague um, and equally subjective. For example, like who gets to decide when this, someone is self-actualized or not? Um, you know, that is kind of a subjective thing. Folks have actually even argued that, okay, self-actualization as a concept reflects a lot of Maslow's own ideas about uh, what he thinks uh, a good person and a fully functioning person would look like, um, those people that he was studying to generate this idea, like Jefferson and Eleanor Roosevelt, um, you know, they may be very well be models of human living, but it's possible to select others. Um, and if maybe we had selected other people, then the concept of self-actualization might look a lot different. Um, so self-actualization has been an interesting and useful concept, but it, it may itself reflect some biases of Maslow, and maybe even um, some of that being like Western individualism. Uh, because, and I think we talked about this back when we talked about Maslow's theories in our motivation unit, the whole idea that as you get closer to the top of the hierarchy, that we're moving toward like self-development, so competence in that self-esteem level, um, or self-fulfillment or fulfillment of one's fullest potential and self-actualization, this is very self-focused. Um, and focus on individuality and maybe not like obligations and relationships with others. Um, so someone maybe from a collectivist culture might come up with a very different view of this hierarchy and even different view of what like self-actualizing tendencies would look like. Um, and of course, most of my students do recognize this. Your textbook points it out explicitly. Um, this perspective is often accused of having the deficit of failing to fully appreciate the human capacity for evil. I mean, whereas Freud kind of assumed that we're all a little evil at our core, and that's our default tendency, um, the humanistic folks went in the other direction, and maybe both are kind of wrong. Um, and I mean, this is fair. It's not that, um, it's not that humanistic folks don't have some explanation for why someone might behave in a way that's not good. They do usually like, you know, someone's maybe not experiencing core conditions for growth or their needs in Maslow's hierarchy aren't being met. Those things would block you from being the good person that you had the potential to be. Um, but the whole idea that like, okay, maybe people do have kind of sometimes nefarious and evil intentions or at least the capacity for such. Um, and that doesn't fit very well 
in this model, um, especially if your needs are met. Like, what about the person who, um, for whatever reason, they're fully fed, they have people that in their life that care about them, they're safe, um, you know, they've achieved some things. So if you look at Maslow's hierarchy, they're, they should be doing okay, but they still go around hurting other people and doing bad things. Like, um, this theory does run out of explanations for that stuff at some point. Um, and that, you know, that might be a problem. I mean, I think in general, like views of people as good can be helpful, but they may be oversimplifying things. Um, so as we close, like depending on where we land in class, I'm likely to have people uh, close with this practice exercise so they can start contrasting psychoanalysis and the humanistic approach. Um, so you're welcome to pause and kind of work through this on your own. Um, I'm also gonna remind people to not forget to uh, fill out that big five inventory for class later this week, because we'll be using that as we start exploring trait theory. Uh, so I hope this helps. I realize it was a little lengthy and I know there's a lot that you're missing by not being in class, but um, hopefully it'll get you what you need so you don't feel off track. Uh, and I hope uh, your travels have brought you safely home by this point. So I'll see you in class uh, later in the week.